Hi, I'm Gary Katz. I want to thank all the folks who bought copies of my DVD programs over the last 20 years. If it wasn't for their support and the support of companies like Windsor One and Stabila, I never would have been able to produce what turned out to be a 10 program series on mastering finished carpentry. Those 12 to 20 year old videos look pretty terrible compared to streaming video today. And that's why I'm no longer selling the DVDs, but the carpentry techniques haven't aged much at all. And that's why I'm making them available here for free. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Gary Katz and welcome to the Onsite Educational Home Building Series. If you're a return viewer, welcome back. In this program, I'm going to be installing a lot of crown molding. First, I'll be working on this ceiling here demonstrating techniques for pre-assembling, coping, and splicing crown. I'll also demonstrate a few different ways for handling bullnose corners and for terminating crown, like the corner of that soffit up there. Then we'll move over to these cabinets. We'll work on installing crown on kitchen ceilings where cabinet doors and ceilings can cause some pretty interesting problems. And I'll be relying on this mock-up too. Some of you may have seen me use this at JLC Live shows and at Cats Road shows. With this mock-up, I'll explain how to install crown on a cathedral ceiling. So stick around. I promise this is going to be fun, and it should be. Whether you're framing or finishing a home, carpentry shouldn't be a fight. You can't do good work if you're struggling with the workpiece, the tools, or with your attitude. Patience and enjoyment are key ingredients for successful finish work. You'll do better work if you're enjoying yourself, believe me. If you make a mistake, don't get hot about it, or you won't learn anything from the mistake. You'll probably make the same mistake a few minutes later and get even madder. Believe me, I'm no king at finished carpentry, but when it comes to making mistakes, I'm a real expert. When something goes wrong, especially with crown molding, stop what you're doing and figure out exactly what happened. That's the only way to turn a bad mistake into a good learning experience. And eventually, you'll enjoy your mistakes, too. Oh, one other thing. I can't start working without a word about safety. Remember, smart carpentry is safe carpentry. Don't work when you're tired. Don't hurry your work. Wear good eye protection and wear hearing protection, too. And watch the slideshow on safety that accompanies this program. Now, let's cover some crown molding fundamentals. Sometimes the key to making finish work easier and more enjoyable means picking the right place to start. Every room is different, so each room requires a different starting strategy. I've included an article on this DVD about crown molding strategies. If you're new to finish work, watch the program before reading the article. That way, you'll understand the article a lot better. Because before you can decide where to start, you have to understand a few basic fundamentals about crown molding. Let's look at these two walls here. I arranged this set so that most of the joinery you find in a home is right here. First, notice how the crown molding touches the wall down here at the bottom of the crown, not up here at the ceiling. The same is true at this outside corner. The crown molding touches the wall at the bottom down here. That means I have to measure from the crown molding down here not up here against the ceiling. And that means my measurement marks are always on the bottom of the crown molding, not on the top. At least, almost always. You'll see what I mean later. So the first thing I do when I'm installing crown is I figure out how far down from the ceiling the crown drops. You can do that with a piece of crown up against the ceiling just like this. Or you can put the molding upside down in your miter saw and measure from the base of the saw up to the bottom of the crown. Some carpenters even make a mock-up of inside and outside corners to lay out their crown, which is a good idea. Here's why. Installing crown molding is like putting a 4x4 four four or a 4x6 four up against the ceiling. If the wall's out of square, or if the ceiling's out of square, there's going to be some big gaps between the crown and the wall or ceiling. Crown is a lot more forgiving than a 4x, 
because it's cut out in the back and you can twist and turn it much more easily. Using a mock-up like this will help you find the true bottom of the crown, especially if the wall and ceiling are out of square or have major bows or bellies. But most carpenters I know use a gauge block cut to the exact drop of the crown. That would be about three and a quarter inches for this profile. With a gauge block, you can quickly mark every corner in a room, then snap lines on each wall. Of course, if the room's already finished, or there's wallpaper and furniture, then I don't snap chalk lines. Even with a Tajima chalk line, there's a small cloud of dust, and the dust from a chalk line can be tough to clean up. In a finished room, you're much better off stretching a dry line and making several nearly invisible marks along the wall, which is what I've done along this wall here. But just because I use a line doesn't mean I install the crown string straight. You can't do that unless the house is framed perfectly straight and all the corners are drywalled straight too, which is really rare. The reason for the chalk line is simple. On most jobs, you have to cheat the crown molding up and down to follow bows and bellies in the walls and ceilings. If you don't have a chalk line or some marks as a reference, you can't tell how much you're cheating. You can cheat crown about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch, but if you push it up or down more than that, it might be visible to someone standing on the floor, especially if the ceiling height is low. You know, while I'm snapping chalk lines, I also make a cut list. A cutlass for crown isn't that much different than a cutlass for baseboard. Let's start with this first piece because it's a little bit weird. It has a self-return on the end right here where the ceiling ends and the crown has to terminate up against the wall. I said a minute ago that you always have to measure crown at the bottom, right? Well, right away we've got an exception to that rule. I want the long point on this corner here to end right there. Yeah, a self-return is really just an outside corner. See, it turns the corner and dies into the wall. But with a self-return, you want the long point to terminate right here at the edge of the soffit. And that means I have to measure across the top of the crown molding. Just like this. So this piece measures about 22 and, oh, we'll make it 5 eighths of an inch. The measurement doesn't have to be spot on. The piece can terminate an eighth of an inch back from the edge of the soffit. So I'll write that measurement down on the cut list here. On the left side of the number, I'll write SR for self-return. And on the right side of the number, I'll put a B for a butt cut. We'll cope this inside corner. I cut these other pieces with miters for a reason. I want to use them to show you something about inside and outside corners. Whether you miter or cope your crown, for an inside corner, the long point of the miter is always here at the bottom of the molding. And the long point of the bevel is against the wall. See what I mean? It's a compound cut. Here's the miter, and here's the bevel. For an outside corner, the short point of the miter is at the bottom of the molding, and the short point of the bevel is against the wall. Remember that when you're cutting at your saw, so you won't have to close your eyes and imagine which way to cut the miter and the bevel. I'll show you that again when I start cutting these pieces of the saw. be cutting and installing these pieces in different ways, especially on this bullnose corner here. But for now, let's say I'm cutting standard 45 degree miters for this outside corners, just like the pieces I just had up here. I stretch my tape measure across here and hold my square to find the short point of the miter, and that's 20 and 9 sixteenths. I'll write that measurement down on my cut list. And on the left side, I write a C for a cope cut. And on the right side, I'll write OC for an outside corner. I usually don't use a mock-up to lay out my crown. 
But while I'm measuring, I always check the corners for square. If the corner's out of square and you cut the creases perfectly square, you'll have to adjust the crown up or down in order to get the joint really tight. And even then, you may not be able to get the joint tight if the corner's way out. And if the pieces are really short like these, it gets even worse. When you're cutting large crown on the flat, you have to read the angle of every corner. When I'm cutting in position, if the corner's out more than two degrees, I just make a note on my cut list and split the angle between both miters. This corner is pretty close to 90 degrees, but if it read 92 degrees, I'd cut the miters at 46 degrees. If the corner read 88 degrees, I'd cut the miters at 44 degrees. Uh, one word of warning, before you start cutting at your saw and wonder why this technique isn't working, remember, the miter gauge numbers on your saw are wrong. 46 degrees is really 44 degrees, and 44 degrees is really 46 degrees. I'll explain more about that when we get to the cathedral ceiling. If you can't wait and you want to know right now about how to use a protractor with your miter saw, you can skip ahead on this DVD at any time. Okay, let's get back on track here. We're making a cut list. This next piece is really similar, but opposite. It measures 10 and 11 sixteenths. Mating pieces are usually opposite. This one gets an outside corner on the left side, and it gets a butt cut on the right. I'll cope the left end of this long piece right into this shorter piece. Now, let's measure for this longer piece, too. First, I'll write this measurement down so I don't forget it. 10 and 11 sixteenths, a butt cut on the right, and a cope, and an outside corner on the left. Now we'll measure for that long piece. There's a couple of different ways to measure this piece. First, I'm going to use this distance measuring tool so I don't have to get down off my ladder and move it over into that corner and then climb up it again. Plus, I'd have to get somebody else to help me to do that. I turn this tool on just by pushing this green button here. And then I position it against the corner wall. And I push this large green button. And it flashes a laser light on the far wall. If I push this green button one more time, it takes the measurement. And this one says it measures 140 and a quarter inches. This thing's right on, by the way. That's probably a snug measurement. I might want to cut it at 140 and 3 sixteenths. If I push this button, I can change the way the distance reads in the display, in centimeters or in feet and inches, or just in inches, which is the way I like it. In case you're wondering, this thing's pretty accurate. This is one of Stavila's first models. It has a lot of bells and whistles. Some of them I don't use, but other tradesmen will, like measuring square footage and cubic footage. And it has a memory, and it'll save all the measurements, too, along with a lot of other functions. By the time you see this DVD, though, I'll probably be using a model that's half the cost and half the size of this one, more like a cell phone. And it won't be long, I don't think, before we're all carrying laser measuring devices on our tool belts, along with tape measures. I mean, imagine having to climb a ladder only twice in one room, or picking up measurements for baseboard from just one corner. You get two walls. But until then, here's another way to measure long walls, especially if you're working alone. In large rooms, when I'm working alone, I like to use a gauge stick piece of wood out of one by two or some kind of small molding like this. And I cut it to exactly 100 inches. I found that works best for a normal room. Then I just make a mark on the far side of it. After that, I pull a measurement from the corner to the mark and just add the measurement to 100 inches. If the wall's really long, I use a gauge stick from both ends and then just measure the distance between the marks in the center. I've got one more piece to measure. This one right here, it's got a self-return on the right and a cope cut on the left. And it measures 32 and 3 quarters. Let me put that on my cut list. A 
self-return on the right and a cope cut on the left. That about does it. You know, before we move to that saw, let's take one more look at that bull nose corner. There's another neat way of installing crown on these bull nose corners. If you like the look, rather than mitering the corner like this and having to fill the bottom of the miter down here, you can cut a three piece outside corner like this one. Personally, I think the more corner joints you have in crown molding, the better it looks, especially in an outside corner. Every corner joint adds shadow lines, but outside corners are definitely the best. And it's not much harder to do a three-piece outside corner. I'll show you how to cut the pieces in a minute and how to make this mock-up too, but right now, let's get some numbers on a cut list. When I'm installing three-piece outside corners, I use a mock-up like this as a measuring device. I put this mock-up in the corner, and I mark the short points of the miters. I also check the corner angle while the mock-up's in place. Three-piece corners usually involve some degree of pre-assembly, and whenever you're pre-assembling moldings, it helps a lot to cut things at exactly the right angle. If this thing were rocking, I'd know that the corner was at the wrong angle, and I'd check it with my protractor, but we already checked this one, and we know it's exactly 90 degrees. You know, I do like to pre-assemble moldings, and I'd like to pre-assemble this whole corner here, but maybe it would be safer to leave this piece right here with the self-return loose, which means I can cope this piece on the left-hand end. That's the easiest end for me to cope. But I think a better strategy would be for me to cope the right hand end of this piece with the self-return. It's a little bit harder, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. But right now, let's get these numbers onto a cut list. This piece measures 20 and an eighth, and it has a butt cut on the left, and a 22 and a half outside corner on the right. And this piece measures 10 and 3 sixteenths, and it has a butt cut on the right and a 22 and a half outside corner on the left. So I'll put those numbers on my cut list. And 10 and an eighth. The left hand end of this piece is going to have a butt cut because we're going to cope this piece into it. And the right hand end of this piece is a 22 and a half outside corner. So I write 22 and a half OC. This piece on this side has a 22 and a half outside corner on the left end, so I write 22 and a half OC. And on this end over here, that's a butt cut because we're going to cope this piece into this piece. Now let's go to the miter saw. I'm sure most of you have heard the phrase upside down and backwards. In program one, Mastering the Miter Saw part one, I covered cutting crown in position and I talked a lot about upside down and backwards. But let's review that quickly right now before I cut the pieces on this list. I like cutting crown in position, but that doesn't mean I cut it in exactly the same position it sits on the wall at the ceiling. If I did that, it would move when the blade touched it and the miters wouldn't be even close. The nice thing about cutting crown in position is that you have to turn it upside down in order to nest it against the fence and the base of the saw. The reason that's a nice thing is because all the measurement marks on the bottom of the molding are then facing up so you can guide your saw blade right to the mark just like cutting baseboard in position. Once you turn it upside down, rock the crown molding until it sits flat against the fence and the base of the saw. Then draw a line across the top of your miter saw fence. I've installed an accessory wooden fence on my saw to make it easier to see that line and also to make it easier to measure the crown, which you'll see in a minute. But drawing a pencil line across the top of the molding, it isn't enough. You have to hold the crown firmly in the same position so that it won't move, not even a little bit. To do that, Always install 
a continuous crown stop, just like this sacrificial board. With a continuous stop, you won't have to worry about short pieces or really long pieces not being adequately supported. But make sure that your stop is perfectly parallel to the fence. And clamp it down good. Believe me, even with a continuous stop, your molding will still move a little. And sometimes that'll result in miters that aren't exactly the same length, like these two. See how this miter is just a little bit longer than that one? With some moldings, this mismatch also happens when the milling is off between the two pieces. But with Windsor 1 material, that's never a problem. So I know this mismatch is a cutting problem. Sure, this joint isn't terrible, but believe me, the better you get at cutting and installing crown, the more critical your eye will become. And little things like this, they'll really bug you. Using a continuous stop will help prevent these mismatch problems. Once you have the stop in place, put an L on the right side and put an R on the left end and circle them. That way you'll avoid getting confused because the molding is upside down and the ends are reversed. Before cutting the molding though, make a kerf at each detent just to be sure you're cutting at the right angle because the continuous stop covers the miter gauge. Now we're ready to cut. While I was on that ladder, I showed you how for inside corners, the long point of the miter and the bevel are against the wall, while for outside corners, the short points are against the wall. The same is true while you're cutting at the saw. The fence on your saw is just like the wall. If I cut this piece, With the long point of the miter bevel against the fence, it's an inside corner. The next piece comes right out in this direction, forming an inside corner. And if I cut this piece, with the short point of the miter and bevel against the fence, it's an outside corner. The next piece turns the corner just like so, forming an outside corner. No matter what type of molding you're cutting, understanding that simple concept makes finish work a lot easier. And having a cut list makes it even simpler. On my cut list, all the angles on this side of the numbers are on the left-hand end of the pieces. Remember? I made the cut list facing the wall, so the left-hand end was always on the left side of the number. The right-hand end is always on the right side of the measurement number. I like to cut the left-hand ends first, this column here, because I'm accustomed to sliding my material through the saw from my left toward my right. Remember, the material is upside down and all the ends are reversed. That's why I put the L on the right side of my crown stop. So I'm always looking at this column first in my cut list. That simplifies things a lot too. Now let's go through this cut list. This first piece has a self return on the left end. That tells me right away that I really need two pieces. First, I need this longer piece that we measured with a self-return outside corner on the left end and an inside corner miter on the right end. And second, I need this little self-return cap 
I always cut self-return caps first so I can get them out of the way and also so they'll be cut from very near the miter on the self-return itself. That way the profiles match perfectly and the grain on stain grade trim will run right around the corner. This little cap has an outside corner on the right end and a butt cut on the left. This piece on my saw already has a butt cut on the left end. Remember, it's upside down. So I just have to cut an outside corner that zeroes out right here. Now we have the cap, so I'll cut the self-return outside corner on the left-hand end of this piece, just like my cut list says. A self-return is nothing more than an outside corner, but I always write down SR because that tells me two things. First, it tells me that I'll need the cap, and second, it tells me to measure the piece differently. Remember, we measured this piece up at the ceiling to where the long point of the crown will terminate at the face of the soffit. I use my continuous crown stop to make measuring this piece a lot easier and quicker. I draw a square line across the stop perpendicular to the end of my accessory fence. While I'm at it, I'll do the same thing on this end of the stop, so I'll be ready for any right-hand self-returns too. Now, I just line the long point of this self-return up with the pencil line on my continuous stop and hook my tape measure on my accessory fence. And that piece measures 22 and 5 eighths. I'm cutting the pieces for a mitered bullnose corner, the first cutlass we made, so this end gets a butt cut. I'll just swing the saw to 90 degrees. This next piece has a cope on the left end, so I miter that end just like I would for an inside corner. Notice the long point of the miter is against the fence the same way it would be on the wall, whether it's a miter or a cope. And measuring from an inside corner is easy. Just hook your tape measure and make your mark. You know, sometimes I can't see the mark while I'm cutting, so I'm going to extend the line around to the back of the molding, too. This end gets an outside corner, so the saw is already swung in the right direction. It always is if there's an inside corner on one end and an outside corner on the other. Plus, the short point of the miter and the bevel are against the fence, just as they should be. I creep the measurement mark up to the blade and then look over the back of the molding to see exactly where the blade's cutting. My hand can't move because it's locked next to the miter saw fence. I only need my thumb here to hold the material so it won't move. And I can move the molding incrementally that way toward the blade and cut each piece precisely to my measurement mark. Now the next piece has an outside corner on the left end. So I'll swing the saw in this direction and cut that first.
This opposite end is a butt cut. But for now, I'll flush this short point up with the edge of my accessory fence. It's much easier to measure accurately that way. I just have to hook my tape measure right on the edge of my fence and make the measurement. That's the other reason I like adding this accessory fence. It's cut with a sharp square end so my tape won't slip off. Now I'll cut this in with a butt cut. The next piece is the long one. I've already cut that. It has an inside corner that I coped on the left end and a butt cut on the right end. The last piece, which goes on that wall over there, measures 32 and 3 quarters of an inch. It has a self-return on the right side and a cope on the left side. For the right-hand self-return, I'll need a left-hand cap. First, I cut the outside corner miter. Next, I cut the butt end right to the heel of the miter. And it has a right hand self return. Remember, self-returns have to be measured from the farthest extension. So I'll put this long point of the miter flush with the pencil line that I made at this end of my continuous stop. And then I'll hook my tape measure on the end of the fence and pull that measurement. 32 and 3 quarters. This end gets an inside corner for a cope, and that's with the long point against the fence. So my saw is already in the right position. I'll just take that line and extend it to the back a little more. See how easy this is when you don't have to close your eyes and visualize which way to swing the saw? Now that we've mitered all the pieces on a list, let's get into coping. And after we cover coping, we'll cut everything for that three-piece bullnose corner. Like most carpenters, when I started in this business, I used a coping saw a lot. But a couple of jobs with large oak crown molding <laughs> forced me to start using a jigsaw. Believe me, it was a fight. And most often, the molding lost. If you use a jigsaw and cut your copes from the top, the saw is always banging against the molding profile. See what I mean? That could damage the sharp edge of the cope, and at the very least, it'll mar the finish. And also, when you use a jigsaw and cut from the top, the grain tears out on the face of the molding, and that's disappointing too. I've been using a Collins coping foot for years now, and I'd never go back. This tool is pretty miraculous. All of us in the business owe a debt of gratitude to David Collins for inventing the coping foot. It's ingenious. I can cope anything with this accessory on my jigsaw. If you want to see more about using this tool, look at the slideshow on coping chair rail. 
Here's how I cope crown molding. First of all, don't do what I did. When you buy this tool, read the instructions. Pay special attention to the part about making this crown jig and to the part about which blade to use. With this jig, coping's a lot easier, faster, and much more accurate. Plus, it's more enjoyable. The jig's important because with the molding upright, you can tell exactly how much to back cut. See, the next piece would come right up out of my jig, straight out of this corner. I'm looking directly down on the corner as long as the crown molding's in this jig. That means if I hold the blade plumb like this, I'm making a butt cut. If I tip the blade back just a little, I'm back cutting. And with the molding upright like this, it's easy to see exactly how far to angle the back cut, which really isn't much. And there's another reason you should read the instructions. Don't use the wrong blade in your jigsaw like I did for three years. Get the blade that David recommends, a Bosch 244D. That's the only blade that works well in this tool. The blade's important. It has only six teeth per inch, which means it cuts aggressively. The gullets are deep too, so they clear waste quickly. Plus, the teeth are set wide apart. If you rub your finger down this blade, it'll cut you. That means the blade cuts a wide kerf, which enables you to scroll around a profile easily. The wide set on the teeth also allows you to use the blade as a file. You don't have to cut right to the edge of the molding profile. Rub this blade against the molding and it'll sand right to your cope line. You may not realize it, but the way carpenters control and use tools is mostly dependent upon how we hold them. First of all, you can't do fine work unless you hold a tool with two hands. That doesn't mean you have to grip the tool with two hands. You just have to have two hands on the tool. And second, there's usually an optimum way of holding a tool and applying pressure on it. You know what I mean? Like a screw gun or a circular saw or a hand plane. If you're new to this tool, this should reduce the learning curve by half. I hold the saw in two positions. When I push the saw away from me, I hold it like this, with my thumb behind the guard. When I'm cutting in the push position, I rest my fingers on the top of the molding, so I'm touching the tool with both hands and touching the molding too. When I pull the tool toward me, I turn it like this, with the blade pointed towards me. When I'm cutting in the pull position like this, I rest my hand on top of the molding and reach my fingers over to touch the tool. Now let's cut with the coping foot. First, I make a plumb cut along this fillet at the top of the crown. That's where this piece will butt into the fillet on the next piece. I don't just push the jigsaw into the wood. I take advantage of the coping foot and tilt the blade into the material, which gives me a lot more control over the cutting speed. Next, I make a series of relief cuts toward the profile. This blade will turn a pretty tight radius, but it can't follow this tight OG. I'll have to come back into this OG from several directions and I don't want to get the blade trapped in there, so I make several relief cuts, which provides an exit strategy. See, we're back to strategies again. I don't care what coping saw you're using, there's no way to follow this tight of an OG and control the back cut. The only way to cut it is to nibble at the material. A jigsaw with a coping foot is a great nibbler. In fact, I use it frequently like a dentist cleaning teeth. First, I'll cut in along the profile as best I can, then I come in from this direction and clean out the cut, using the angle of the blade to back cut. I've done all I can in the push position, at least for now, so I switch to the pull position and cut the overlapping finger on the bottom of the molding. I cut that finger thick, almost an eighth of an inch, so it won't break off when I'm climbing a ladder. See how I tilt the blade into the material to control the cut? Since I cut this finger so thick, I have to make a small mortise in the previous piece, but I'll show you that in a minute. I continue cutting in the pull position, bringing the saw up right next to the edge of the profile. Notice I'm cutting by tipping the motor and the blade back and forth. When the blade is tipped toward the kerf, I'm actually cutting, but when I tip the blade backwards, I'm sanding the cut to the profile line. Once you're comfortable with the tool, you'll be cutting right to the line most of the time, but until you've cut the same piece of material 20 or 30 times, you'll probably want to use this technique. Now I'll go back to the push position and finish cutting to the bottom of the coat. 
By resting the blade against the material, I can slowly ease the blade right along the cope. And by tilting the saw rather than pushing it, I can stop the cut right at this delicate spot. This cope fits into the butt end on this other piece, and they both go up on that offset up there, you know, with the outside corner on the right end. Let me turn them a little bit so you can see the joint, and that way I can show you how I make this neat little miter mortise. You can see that the cope fits almost perfectly, except it's not falling into place right through here, and that's because the finger on the end of this cope here isn't falling down into the second piece. It's just too thick. Well, I'm going to take my utility knife and I'm just going to trace this little miter here and I'll make a little miter mortise. I'll trace a little line on there and then I'll take my knife and just rock it on there and make a shoulder cut right there on that miter. And then to relieve that waste, I'll come in from the side here and rock my blade back and forth and just pop that little piece out. And then the cope will fall nicely against the second piece, just like this. I think coping is an extremely important subject. We should be coping every inside corner whenever possible. And we could all improve our coping techniques, I'm sure. So I invited a special guest in for this program. Here's David Collins. Hey, David, come on in. Good to see you. Gary, thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, I you're welcome. really feel honored. And you're I've got to tell you, I've admired this guy's work for a long time, truly. Hey, can you think of somebody better to demonstrate this coping foot than the guy who invented it? David, why do you think we should cope all of our inside corners? One major reason quickness of installation. You simply cannot cut and install miters and get them up there as fast as you can get up copes. Guys are discouraged by copes because they think it's hard work, but in fact, when you're finished, you got done a lot quicker. It looks better, stays together. Absolutely. I've found that it, I can probably cope crown molding and baseboard almost, I can probably install it almost twice as fast just because I don't have to cut the pieces right exactly to the same length, to the right length. I mean, my measurements and don't have to be right on. Precisely. And every yeah. angle has to be perfect if you're going to miter it. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And with a cope, you don't because you use exactly. a lot of wiggle room with a cope. And on top of that, you have no way to draw those pieces together, especially with modern construction where we're pressing sharpened points against drywall, which is very soft. It'll punch right in there. And then if it goes in there, the next piece the only way to get it to come back together is to drive shims and hammer and bang and uh... absolutely <laughs> and it also solves the problem with like irregular walls and stuff like that where you have irregularities in bows and bellies yes if there's some kind of little irregularity you can force fit something and really shove a sharp the sharp point of a cope right into the next piece and exactly boy, everything looks good exactly and it'll sort of the edge itself even if you don't have very much back cut to it will uh, sort of crumple just a tiny bit and also it'll press its way even to a, a piece of hardwood. Oh yeah, give, I've seen I've seen bit. oak edges cut right into a next yeah, the next piece of oak. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, we only cope one end of each of four pieces in a in a, a rectangular room. Oh, so never do a install, double. So you don't do double copes. No, unless you're ever. doing an, an octagon. Oh. In which case you're doing overlays and the last one has to close. Sometimes I've found I like to Kind of my strategy includes like a double cope or something, but that's cool. Everybody installs moldings different ways. <laughs> well, know? a double cope is almost as hard as a double miter. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. It's time consuming. Well, instead of talking about it so much, why don't we just demonstrate, you demonstrate your technique for doing be this. Be glad to. Because yes. I've already shown everybody how I do it, and it might be a little Mickey Mouse, you know? So let's see how you do it. <laughs> yeah, right. Cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is the coping foot. It fits on most professional jigsaws, uh, does not fit uh, any of the porter cables, and there are a few uh, exceptions. But uh, it basically transforms a jigsaw into a free-handing power tool, and it gives you uh, just some amazing maneuverability and helps you eliminate a lot of the handwork that you're typically going to be involved in on the job site. Uh, single point of bearing. Notice how narrow it is. You can get this tool really close 
to a uh, backsplash or a wall because uh, the width of the saw is your only limitation. The, the base itself does not uh, uh, interfere. And you can actually go right between uh, a bottom plate and a wall. So it, the accessibility and maneuverability with this tool are tremendous. To use this thing well, you want to remember one major thing, and that is that you start and finish every cut with the blade tilting back like this. Don't start straight up and down. Look at the nose of it. It's slanted in relationship to the blade. So you want a bearing surface and you want to get into the material and pry to your line so that you can accurately get in there and maneuver. This point right here, uh, some carpenters like to make this into a miter and they'll leave a little bit of this and then they'll cut the joining piece and it takes time and uh, it ends up looking like a miter, but this is a cope. I like for it to look like a cope and I like to get it finished too. So in order to make this tight, uh, what I'll do is stand it on the miter saw. I'll make the first cut with that miter saw because it's much cleaner than you'll ever do with a jigsaw and or a coping saw. Let's cope. Start and finish all cuts with the blade leaning back. That way you can get into the material, you've got a bearing surface on that sloping front of the coping foot, and then you simply pry in to your line. You can hit it right on because you've got that lateral support. You just pry right up to your line. Now when you come to the end of a run and you're cutting into the original relief cut, if your blade is not tilting back, you'll break through that original relief cut and uh, you'll cut into your profile, so you want to really avoid that. Notice as I work my way up through here that I'm in constant contact with the back side of that, no matter what that angle is. We're right there on it and have plenty of support uh, to make a nice, smooth, even uh, cut with no vibration in it. Now right here you notice I've cut this with the miter saw first and uh, I like to do that because it's nice and clean and that's what people are going to see is that joint and so uh, do that with a miter saw because it's a perfect cut it won't have any jagged edges at all like you might get uh, trying to come in there with a, a coarse bladed jigsaw and that's the way it goes right there you see I'm holding this molding on a plumb line and uh, you're assured immediately when you look at this that it's going to go up on the wall and you're not going to have to climb down and file on it. I've discussed with many young carpenters the business of coping steep moldings like 135 degrees you would find in an octagonal ceiling or a bay window and uh, many people don't even know you can cope that and typically will miter it. Well, if you've done that, you know that mitering those is a struggle to make them tight. And as soon as you put a nail in one of those pieces, it blows away from the other piece. Let me show you how to cope them. To begin with, uh, the angle is going to be the same on your miter saw. You're going to miter a piece at 22 and a half degrees. Now the question is, how do you hold it to understand this whole concept of back cutting in order to overlay the joining piece? You need some kind of a holder, and I have made a number of holders, jigs, to hold the piece. And what I've come up with here, I think, makes more sense than anything else. It's simply a couple of boards screwed together. The angle that you're looking at right here is going to be either 38 or 45 degrees according to the, the uh, spring angle of your crown molding. And uh, this is the way the tool works. Your crown molding is just going to lay right down on that like that. And as you can see, uh, it's on its side. In normal circumstances, it's going to go like this. This is the way it would show up on the wall and on the ceiling. Now we've just put it on its side. Now since we're doing 135 degrees, you don't want to hold it so that it's at 90 with a plumb line. You have to pitch it so that the plumb line shows you exactly how it's going to go and then it works just like the box that we showed you earlier coping out a 90 degree angle. Now let me show you how it attaches to your sawhorse. As you install it, this back piece simply goes between the legs of your sawhorse and uh, you can purchase 
a big half inch wing nut for a piece of half inch all thread and uh, you can very quickly clamp it down and that wing nut puts a tremendous amount of pressure on there it's not going to go swiveling around on you and you can use a pair of pliers and clamp it a little tighter if you would like to. A wooden Jorgensen clamp is just perfect for holding this down. Uh, it won't bruise the wood like maybe a metal clamp would and it holds it uh, very powerfully. It's not going to move on you at all. Now let me show you how to adjust this so that you can cope it just exactly right. This is on a horizontal line. We want to put it on a 45 degree angle. So I like to uh, use a uh, little level and uh, simply set it up. I have the, the uh, vial here set at 45 degrees and now I know that if I stay under plumb from this point right here that uh, in fact I'll just go a little bit more it won't hurt a thing but just as long as you know that plumb is your mark. Let me show you how to cope a 135 degree angle using a jigsaw with a coping foot on it. To begin with you want to mark with your pencil, your line, because truthfully it's difficult to see, especially as you get older. <laughs> you want to make sure that line is uh, real clear so that you don't uh, overshoot it. Before I put this on here and uh, fastened it down, I made a cut on the miter saw at 45 degrees. And uh, I did this right on this portion that's going to be overlaying the piece it joins to because I want a really pretty cut there. And if I take a guess at 45 with my jigsaw, it might be raggedy looking. And you're going to look up and see this one little tiny spot right here. So we do it perfectly, more perfectly on a miter saw than we will by hand. So that's ready to go. I want you to notice that I'm using a different blade here. I really like the uh, wide set on the tooth of the 244, but that blade's not long enough to do a 135. And so I've chosen a progressor, and it has a little bit of set, doesn't turn very well, but it's longer and it'll pass through these long cuts that we're going to have to make on this particular joint. Just like when you were cutting the regular 90, you want to tilt your blade back every time when you start a cut. Now I'm going to stay just a little bit under a plumb line here and I'm not going to try to cut to the line because we're going to sharpen that line with sandpaper on a stick so that it'll lay on there perfectly. Keep that blade tilted back. Do all of your straight cuts first, your straight relief cuts. Put cuts on any tight inside curves because you'll get trapped in there if you don't when you try to make those curves. Make all these cuts. Typically I'll make about four relief cuts working the way around there. Do not try to split the line when you're doing 135s. Leave the pencil line. Now as I break through one of these cuts, since the blade is tilting back, we don't accidentally break through and cut into the profile. It's very important to keep that blade tilted back. Here where I started with a miter saw, you see that edge is real clean, just lay the blade on that cut you made with the miter saw. Now we're ready to sharpen the edge. I've back cut it all and the portion that's going to touch the joint, we want that to be really crisp so that uh, there aren't any gaps there whatsoever. So we'll do that with a sanding stick. What I've done here is just taken a rounded stick with a few flat sides on it and put some sticky paper on there. This is a great tool and it uh, is used on a perfect plumb line. You do not want to back cut with your sanding stick because uh, you don't want that edge to be real uh, flexible. You want it to have a little flat surface on it where it contacts the joining piece. 
and it'll take you just a little bit to sharpen this up, but believe me, when you're finished, it is well worth it because then all you have to do is lay it up there and nail it, and you're finished. Now earlier, I said that we wanted to set it up so that it would work on a plum cut. So this piece, just like the 90 that we did earlier, is going to go right through there on a plumb line, but all it's contacting is that edge. Most of the crown molding we install as finished carpenters is only three and a half or four and a half inches wide, but once in a while you run into something that is a very difficult challenge. This is almost impossible with a regular coping saw and it will cramp you up like crazy. That's where you just have to have one of these things. And I'd like to demonstrate it with this piece of crown molding here to show you just what kind of time you can save using this tool. For this purpose, I'm just holding this in the jig I showed you earlier. Uh, we could put it in a channel, but this thing works whether you're going plum or level or 90 or 135 or whatever. Uh, you simply level it out when you clamp a piece here. And in the end, you may make one of these and use nothing else. Another reason I want to demonstrate how to cope this molding is because this particular molding gets a needle point on it. Typically, I would just cut this off, but this is not square to the wall. Let me show you what I mean. I'm representing the wall with this piece of wood right here, and I'm going to show you with this square that I'm only touching the very bottom contact point there. And uh, the reason is this is beveled back. Now when you cope this, you end up with a little sharp sliver on there. I want to show you how to do that. We're going to cope this as if it were a small piece in the normal manner. The only difference being it's pretty big and we have this little needle point on here. Again, always start your cuts with your blade tilting back so that you can pry up and get your line exactly and also finish the exact same way so that you won't break through a relief cut and cut into your profile. Put plenty of relief cuts in those curves. Now I'm going to go right through this entire S curve here uh, just mostly to demonstrate how maneuverable a jigsaw can be. And uh, you play around with this thing for a while and after you've used it for a period of time, uh, you'll be a master of it, and uh, it will be a real friend to you. Now at this point, I have a little bit of a challenge here, and how we're going to solve it is with a support stick. What I use is a little ripping that has a channel in it that I simply lay in here. Now you can do this with a coping saw when you're coping shoe molding or you can do any molding whatsoever that ends up with this particular uh, configuration that is a little sharp sliver. When you lay this in here you're going to put the back edge of your blade against that stick and then tilt the blade until you're just touching the finest edge of that point and then you can move forward, you have support for your saw and you have support to prevent you from uh, going sideways. I cut through there pretty fast and occasionally you won't quite hit your line and you may want to dress it up a little bit. If you have set to the tooth you can take care of a lot of that with your jigsaw but always keep that little sander handy because it's nice to have that edge just perfect particularly if you are going to be staining the material. Dave. Thank you for coming. I'm so glad you came and showed everybody how to do that. 
Well, Gary, I really do appreciate you asking me, and my hope is that all of the young men especially that see this film go out there and excel and pursue excellence, and everybody wants to hire them, and they not only have more jobs, they get done quicker, and, and they, they make more, more money. money. Exactly. Right. That's Perfect. why we're hey, here. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. For more on coping crown molding and to learn about the Cope Master, a revolutionary tool for production trim work, be sure to read the articles and watch the slideshows on this DVD. We cut all the pieces on the first list, but that was for a mitered outside corner. Now let's cut all the pieces on the second list for a three-piece bullnose corner. Remember, to make assembling that bullnose corner a little easier, I wanted to start by coping the right-hand end of the self-return piece. That way I can install all the corner pieces, or pre-assemble them, without worrying about any of the joints. Coping the right-hand end is a little harder because you get used to doing something a certain way and then you start thinking it's really hard when it isn't. You might not be as good at a different technique because you haven't practiced it as much. Here's how I cope the right hand end. Practice this yourself a few times and you'll see what I mean. I've placed the molding in my jig facing me. No, I didn't, I'm not going to cope it over here with my left hand. That would be really dangerous. But I do reverse my approach. I use the pull position to start the cut rather than the push position. I keep both hands on the tool again, and I rock the saw until the blade comes right up against the bottom of the fillet. And then I back it out and come into the OG, and I try to follow the OG as best I can, but I can't go too far, I won't be able to back the blade out. So then I back the blade out, and I come into the next fillet, and I cut right up against where that deep cove begins. And then I back the blade out again, and I cut right in to the OG again, and I start making several curves into the OG and wiggling that blade back and forth. You notice as I wiggle that blade back and forth, it's just kind of nibbling away all the waste. It's really easy to control this, you'd be surprised. And I'm just gonna nibble away the top up here too until I clean out the whole OG area completely. And now I'll come down and still in the pull position, I'll cut the little finger on the bottom of the crown molding and come right up up to that cove again and stop. And then I'll start in, you notice I switch my left hand to the bottom of the molding so I'm still touching the tool with both hands and I'll follow that cove all the way back down to the bottom of that finger and be real careful right there as that piece of waste falls out so I don't clip off that finger. Now I'm going to turn the tool around into the push position and I've got to slide my thumb back pretty far on the, on the coping foot because the coping foot's going to disappear as I climb up through that cove right up to the top slowly and I'm rocking the blade back and forth There, there's the top. This piece can now be cut to lengthen the miter saw. I can hook my tape measure on the long point of that cope and pull my measurement. That was 22 and 5 eighths, right to the bottom of the crown here. You know, once you become proficient at coping precisely, you can measure before cutting the cope. But this end gets a self-return, right? Not a, not a regular outside corner. So I can't measure to the bottom of the crown molding. It's the top of the molding that matters. Now I could eyeball from this measurement, oh, but that wouldn't be very precise, transferring the, the measurement down to the bottom here. So instead, I'm going to figure out what the drop on this crown is, what the projection of the crown is. It's three and a quarter. And I'm going to measure over on my fence three and a quarter inches and make a mark on the top of the fence there. Then I'm going to line up the long point of that cope with that mark. And now 
I can pull a measurement and I'll be exactly three and a quarter inches short and I'll make my mark at 22 and 5 eighths. Right there. And that's an outside corner too. So I want to swing my saw so that the short point on this piece will be up against the fence. The next piece has a butt cut on the left and a 22 and a half outside corner on the right and it measures 20 and an eighth. I'll cut that butt cut first. I'll clean this end up. And it measures 20 and an eighth. And that is a 22 and a half outside corner. Now I need a 5 eighths inch long piece, that little short one, to cap the corner, cut with 22 and a half outside corners on both ends. I made a mark here, 5 eighths of an inch back from the edge of my fence, so I can flush the short point of this outside corner up and not even have to pull my tape out. There we go. I've got the mark on this other end of the fence too, but right now, that's just so I can cut these little corner pieces repetitively. It's a lot more precise to use a mark like that than having to pull your tape measure out over and over again. And these 5 eighths inch marks, they're good for almost every bullnose corner, crown and baseboard. Now I'll cut the last piece that goes around the corner. It has a 22 and a half on the left side and a butt cut on the right and it measures 10 and 3 16 So here's the 22 and a half on the left. Ten and three sixteenths to a butt cut. I'll pre-assemble these three pieces. I want the joints tight and square. The longest piece I needed for this room wasn't much more than 12 feet, but lots of times I run into walls that are longer, much longer, like big great rooms or hallways in hotels and commercial buildings. Rooms like that always require splices in the crown molding. Splicing crown molding up on a ladder can take more time than turning a corner, especially if the walls and ceilings aren't straight. To make splices easier and less noticeable, especially in stain grade work, I pre-assemble all of them. I make splices up with compound miters so that I have more glue surface and the joint hides and the grain better. I also rip a piece of plywood just like this so it's just narrower than the shoulders on the back of the crown and that way it won't interfere with fitting the crown up against the ceiling and the wall.
I assemble the pieces against my saw so I'll have a straight edge to work with. When you assemble a splice, be sure the two pieces are in a perfectly straight line. I just have to hold that for a few seconds until that fast acting glue dries. This technique was a lot more difficult before fast acting glue appeared, believe me. I put some fast acting glue on one end of the plywood and then you'll see what I'm going to do here once that sets up. I'm just going to hold this real hard until it sets and I put it on the piece that has the inside corner cut so the long points against the plywood and then I take yellow glue and I put it on the actual miter itself and I like to get a good amount of glue right on the face of the miter just like so and I'll put yellow glue on the face of this miter too I got a little too much on here so I'll just transfer that over to here it's really important to glue up these miters completely I'll talk about this more but if you don't and you're using stain grade material, if you don't seal the end grain on these miters, the stain can creep around the corner and penetrate the wood right at the end grain. And that's why sometimes your miters and your splices are a little bit darker than the surrounding wood. And now that I got this all ready to go, I'll put some fast acting glue on this piece of plywood down here. And I'll spray the back of this piece And I'll just line this miter up really nicely and push it down tight. And I'm using the fence to hold the piece straight. And I've got a good splice joint here. It'll just need a tiny bit of sanding. And I'm just going to hold this together real good until that glue dries on the plywood. I know the fast acting glue will hold. But just in case, I like to staple the plywood to the crown too. I'm going to do that in just a second. There, that should get it. I'm going to turn this over carefully. I use, a fine, I use a fine wire staple gun with a wide crown. The staples are about a half an inch long, so they won't penetrate too far and come out the face of the crown. I like to put these pieces off to the side near the walls that go on while I make up whatever other splices I need. That gives the yellow glue a little time to set and strengthens the joint before I pick it up again to cut the piece to exact size. I like to pre-assemble all my self-returns before I install the pieces on the wall. I use fast-acting glue if the profiles aren't too elaborate. 
but if the profile of the molding is delicate and involved, or if I'm shaking more than usual, I use spring clamps and tight bond glue, so I'll have more time to fuss the pieces together just right. These two short pieces are a good example. They form the mitered corner that we cut to go around that bull nose. I'm gonna glue this up and make sure that I seal that end grain really well. Just like I said the last time, we don't, if you're doing stain gray work especially, you don't wanna leave any of that end grain exposed or the stain can creep around the corner and darken your joints. It's much easier to assemble a outside corner correctly down here rather than up on a ladder. When I pre-assemble crown, I always use a layup table. This is just a board. It can be made up out of anything, a strip of plywood or MDF that's cut perfectly square. And I tack two strips onto the edges here. The strips will help hold the crown in position while I clamp it, and they also help ensure that the joint is square. That's not nearly as important on a wall as it is on a mantelpiece or a cabinet, but it's still pretty important to make sure your joinery is perfectly square. I'll talk about that more when we get to those cabinets over there. First, I glued these up, and then I put them up against the strips, and I've got this Collins clamp just at the bottom of the molding here. I can see the top of the molding. Remember, it's upside down. So the measurement marks are right up here, right where I can see them. That's how I check to make sure that the measurement marks line up and I'm not crowding any of the measurement marks. If you crowd the measurement marks, then your measurements won't be right on. You'll be defeating all that careful measuring you did, especially with a double outside corner piece that wraps around a column. It might not even fit after you put it up in place. I also look to make sure that the pieces are perfectly square and tight against the sides of this layup table, right up against the strips. That's the only way to be sure the joint's square. You know, most of us look at the joint first right here, and we get distracted by the fit, but really, that's the last thing that's important. You can always sand this joint a little, unless the molding's pre-finished, but that's a totally different problem. I'll get to that when I work on those cabinets over there. I've got the outside corner pieces to that together, and I've got this self-return here, so all that's left is to pre-assemble this inside corner. I mitered these too, even though I didn't put it on the cut list that you saw, because I wanted to demonstrate how to pre-assemble an inside corner miter too. After all, if the pieces are short enough, I always miter my inside corners rather than cope them. For an inside corner, turn the molding right side up, and then glue your pieces. glue the other piece too. If the back of the molding's tight, the profile on the front's usually pretty nice. I can put a spring clamp on the back right down here, but getting one into this area, it's another story. It can be a real problem. Let me adjust this until I get these miters just right. That's pretty good. And I'll load up another spring clamp if you're working with hardwood, you might want to try this trick that one of the guys at the road show taught me last year. I'm just going to take this spring clamp and open it up and make a couple of marks here in the back of this crown and then take it off. And I'll take a drill motor with a small bit and just drill a couple of shallow holes right there. That way I can take that clamp and put it right back on there. And it'll bite into those little holes and it won't slip off. You know, let me tell you something. Some of you might think you don't have to buy the wrench that comes with the spring clamps. 
Yeah, it's possible to open up these clamps with your hand, but, and I've learned this the hard way, so take my word for it. If the clamp slips off of here and you're adjusting this miter, there's only one place it's gonna go. It's gonna land right on your finger or on your thumb, and I'm telling you, you won't be strong enough to open up that clamp then. You'll wanna get this wrench and you'll wanna get it fast. Pre-assembling crown molding makes the job a lot easier, especially a three-piece outside corner like this one. This is the mock-up I made for measuring all the corners. I use fast-acting glue for three-piece bullnose corners for that mock-up and for finished pieces too because it's tough to get spring clamps on these small 22 and a half miter joints. You probably saw these lines on my layup table before. Now you can see what they're for. One of these lines is pretty close to perfect for this crown. That's how I start laying up these corners. Sometimes I just eyeball the piece until they're parallel to the line. But this one is pretty close to, it was right on that line. The layup table helps keep the joint square and allows me to push these pieces together pretty hard to get the joint as tight as I can. I'll put some glue on this piece. and I'll spray this one. And pinch that in there. I could put my finger on the top of this just to make sure it's flush, and then I can push against the fence, against my little fence here, and get this joint nice and tight. Without the layup table, I wouldn't be sure that this corner was square. And it would also be hard to get the joint really tight to hold pressure on it. Now I'll try the second piece. first and then push this one up to it. Make sure that they're flush and you can see by holding this tight I'm getting a perfectly square corner. Now if the corner you're working on is out of square you might want to put a shim in between the table and the crown to make sure that you're assembling your pieces so they'll fit around the corner when you're finished. The glue dries pretty fast, so there isn't really a lot of time to fool around. Once I have it positioned right, I press really hard and hold it for about 15 seconds or so just to be sure the glue sets before I pick it up. Yeah, that should do it. And there's the corner. I don't know what it is about crown molding. I have fun cutting it, and I have fun putting it in too, as long as I'm not in a rush. A pre-assembled section like this is really easy, if you measure everything accurately, and if you cut each piece precisely. This is that section I made with the mitered inside corner. Let's put this up right now. That looks good there. Uh-oh, this piece isn't touching the corner. And it's because this piece is too long. And it's forcing this piece here away from the corner. But that's no big problem. I'll just plane a little bit off of the back of this piece, and it'll allow this piece to come right into the corner 
and then this piece will come up against the wall. That looks a lot better. Never nail within two feet of a corner unless you have both finished pieces in all the corners. So I'd leave this corner over here loose until I get the long piece on the wall. I'm using an 18 gauge brad nailer to put these up. It shoots a two and an eighth inch brad which is plenty long enough for this light duty crown here. If the crown were any bigger I'd switch to my 15 gauge gun. You know, pre-assembling crown is great, but you can't do it all the time. If the pieces are too long, then I like to put them up one at a time. The danger of installing the pieces on an outside corner like this one at a time is that I might focus too much on getting this mitered corner here just right without realizing that I'm twisting the pieces at the wrong spring angle. And if I change the spring angle of this piece here too much, I'll have a tough time getting this corner tight and I might even have to cope this long piece a second time, so I'd like to avoid that. Pre-assembling corners can be a lot faster, but you've got to be careful. Since we're on the subject of installing pre-assembled crown, let's put up that three-piece outside corner. I'll just tack that so it won't fall down and I can still move it around a little bit. I've got to fit both the free ends, this one and this one, before I can nail this assembly off entirely. Now, I'll fit this piece up. This is the piece I coped on the right hand end, remember? And it terminates right here at the back of the soffit. And before I can finish this, I have to make that little notch on the bottom here. And I'll take my utility knife and I'll just trace the miter on the bottom of this cope. And then I'll get this out of my way for a minute. And I'll get in here and I'll rock my blade back and forth in here and remove that waste. You know, if you're smart, there, I've got it. If you're smart, you'll make this little mortise before sticking a piece up against the ceiling, before putting the assembly up there. But really, making these little mortises isn't that tough as long as your knife's sharp. On hardwood moldings, you want to use a chisel probably. Fitting the corners is easy as long as you don't nail the pieces off too soon. If the corners open at the top, then tap the crown down. If the corners open at the bottom, then tap the crown up. Most of the time, severely open corners are the result of not checking the corner with a protractor before cutting the miters. But bad walls and ceilings also affect joinery. This all looks pretty good, and it should. I'll show you why in a minute. Before I bring that long piece up here, I think I'll find some studs. I use this tot lock key as a stud finder. You can buy a fancier one, but a strong magnet like this works just fine too. But be careful with it because it's white. And if you're working on a white ceiling, I promise you'll leave it up there sometime. 
I just take this and slide it across the wall until I find some backing in there. I'll feel it. I'll feel the backing pulling on the magnet, and I'm sliding right near the bottom marks that I made for the crown. There's there's a stud right in here, and I'll just put a mark right there near the bottom of the crown line, and I'll get one back in here. So there's another one right in here, right near the bottom of the crown line, so I can see where those marks are when I'm putting the crown up. And then I'll get some on the ceiling too. There should be. There's a joist right here. Oh, there's one there. So we got backing there. And we should have, oh, there's one. So I'll put another little line right here. Now let's get that piece of crown. Dave Collins just taught me how to use a crown holder like this. What a handy tool. If you want to make one of these for your crown, see the article on this DVD. You can make it like this one, or you can make like I did this one here where I followed the profile a little bit closer, but you don't really have to follow the profile. And you know, if you have one of these, you don't really need to snap lines because the tool positions the crown at exactly the right angle, which makes it great for jobs where the walls aren't being painted or there's wallpaper but most of the time I'll snap lines anyway just to be sure. I wait to nail off the majority of the crown until all the pieces are in place. Sometimes you can't follow the ceiling because there's a hole or a wiggle in it. It could be way out. I carry a small pry bar to help work the crown molding and I cut small shims like this from MDF or from cross grain wood so they'll break off easily. I use the shims to help support and straighten the crown anywhere the walls are really bad. Remember, you can't cheat more than a quarter of an inch or so off of a straight line or someone will see the wiggle in the molding. When I'm through fastening the crown, I also cock it to the wall and cover the shims. Sometimes the crown isn't tight against the wall in other places too, like right here, especially near corners. And that can be caused by steel framing connectors, drywall mud buildup, or just poor framing. And that's all typical on most job sites. When I install paint grade trim, I always carry a caulking gun, and I caulk these kind of gaps and cracks before anyone sees them. I know some carpenters, some carpenters will argue this point with me, because caulking is really the painter's job, and some painters might get upset if you do the caulking. But I've found it's best to do everything I can to make my work look better, even if it means doing a little of someone else's work. For stain grade molding though, I never caulk. I place little bits of blue tape. For instance, right here where this wall is, and there's kind of a bow right here. Between the bullnose corner and the drywall mud buildup in the corner here, there's a bow, a little bow in the wall here. I'll put a piece of blue tape on the crown, or I'll even put a piece of blue tape right on the wall. That way, the homeowner or the contractor won't think I'm trying to get away with something, especially where I have to shim the molding. Instead, I draw everyone's attention to the uneven walls and ceilings, and I point out that my joints are tight, and my work looks good, and that I tried to follow a snap line, and even cheated the crown away from the line wherever I could to make it look better than it would have. I like to explain how in order to make the job look right, they really need to have the painter or the drywall float the walls in wherever there's blue tape. In fact, that's what we did before shooting this video. 
I put up a few pieces of crown and quickly discovered that the ceiling had a huge hole in it. The wall was out of plumb and the crown looked terrible. So we floated in the ceiling right to the crown. Then we removed the crown and floated back to the walls. This is a good lesson to remember too because it affects how you bid a job. When I'm asked to install stain grade crown in a home that's already finished with painted walls or wallpaper, I'm really careful about bidding. I take a ladder to the job and I sight the walls and the ceilings as best I can. I look for low or high joists. Sometimes you can't see them and only a level will be able to reveal if the walls and ceilings are out. A five foot level like this is about the perfect length because you can hold it safely and securely over your head and it's long enough to check the corners for poor framing or drywall mud buildup. I also carry a square with me, a framing square like this, just to check the corners to see how bad they really are. If the walls and ceilings are out to lunch and I still get the job after bidding it sky high, I start the installation by making small test pieces for inside and outside corners just to check the fit of the joints before cutting anything. That's the same technique I use for pre-finished crown on kitchen cabinets, which I'll be showing you later over on the other wall. But while we're still here on this wall and talking about bidding, let's look at backing too. Some carpenters like to install backing before putting up the crown molding, especially on long runs or where the ceiling joists are running parallel to the wall. Depending on the size of the crown, a piece ripped from a 2x4 or from 5 quarter stock usually works well. Lots of suppliers carry a 5 quarter finger joint jam stock that's perfect for making something like this. You know what? I put this piece up and I forgot to cut the little notch in the end of it, in the bottom of it, for the finger on this cope. And you know what's really silly? That's the second time I've done that, but what's really silly is when you're doing paint grade work, you don't really have to cut these little fingers on here like this. It's mostly for stain grade stuff, and I don't know, if you get persnickety like I do sometimes and you just want everything to look just perfect, you can cut these on paint grade too, but you don't have to. When you make this cope, you can make this just a square cut with your coping saw. I'm going to nip this off right now. I'll just take my utility knife and cut that off, and I'll just cut it square. First, I'll score it so it doesn't snap off in the wrong place, and then I ought to be able to just break this right off. There we go. Great. That now will be like a butt joint. And this piece will butt right into that one. Oof, that's nice and tight now. This spot needs a shim too. That'll do it. I install backing mostly in commercial buildings where I'm working with steel studs. I don't install backing in homes too much. I found that cross nailing holds the molding just fine, which is what I was doing here. Just nailing one, one nail in one direction and another nail in the other direction. I've never had a piece move, not even on jobs I've visited 10 or 15 years after I installed the trim. For more on crown molding, including kitchen cabinets and cathedral ceilings, play the next DVD.
This program is made possible by support from the following corporations who care about education in the construction industry. Windsor One, wood in its prime. Producers of the highest quality trim boards, moldings, and specialty wood products for architectural detailing. Bosch Power Tools and Accessories, supporting education, career development, and the future of the construction trades with a diverse line of corded and cordless products. Serious work, serious tools, Senko. Stabila. On-site productions, authoritative instruction in print, video, DVD, and personal presentations. Be sure to visit www.garymcats.com, a comprehensive community devoted to finished carpentry and architectural millwork.